Can you guys hear me? Oh, now. All right, so I was going to talk about myself, but now you guys know everything. <laughs> All you need to know. So yes, um, I'm a civil engineer. I'm teaching GS 101, actually a class this afternoon. And I spent a mm, few years in the Anderson Hall. That was like 20 years ago. And at some point, I mean, I've been working uh, for Glenn Fowler for 11 years. And I'm very lucky that I had the opportunity to work in very diverse projects. And I was a water resources engineer, but I ended up you know, being like the GIS person in my company. And that allowed me to, to do many things. And at some point, I feel like I am the one that when people don't really know how to do something that involves a lot of data, they come and they ask me, how can we do this? So that was like the typical experience for me in this project, because we didn't have a clue of how to tackle this. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, let's see what works. So the, the, the bad news for you is that it is July 2014, because I presented this at the ESRI conference in 2014. Uh, and that was all fresh in my mind. And then when I, when I said to Coco, like, yes, I can present this, I'm like, oh my god, it's been so many years, and half of the people are not there. <laughs> like, I cannot ask them, what did we do exactly? So anyway, I think I, I remember all, most of the details. So when I presented at the ESRI conference in San Diego, it's an international conference, and I thought, well, people might not know what the project area is, but this is where the project area was. Is there a pointer here? Uh, oh, oh, that blew my surprise slide here. All right, so this was a project that it's supposed, well, the plan was to uh, go from the Lechmere station in this part of Cambridge and extend about five miles all the way to Union Square. And it involved, uh, you know, adding five miles of track and building seven stations and a vehicle maintenance facility. So it was pretty exciting. And, and then, you know, this is a project area down in Boston, in Cambridge, and for those of you who are not familiar with this area, it's super dangerous, right? Like if you've seen uh, Mystic River and, you know, the town. So I was very lucky that I didn't get to be in the field at all. I was just always in my cube. Somebody else goes out there, grabs all the data. And actually some of my friends were like, it's a little sketchy, but they didn't have to deal with any of those type of things. That's the only joke I have here, by the way. From now on, it's all like psh, psh. Anyway, so um, our role, my company's role, was to do many different things. We, had, um, we were part of a joint venture with HDR and Gildane, and with a lot of the uh, management of the construction process, and also the design process. Uh, we were the lead environmental uh, design and construction. We had a lot of site characterization going on. This slide is... Um, it's a rendering from one of the data visualization um, exercises that they were doing because the community, uh, everybody wanted to see how things were going to look like when it's done. And we had to do a lot of uh, meetings with um, really like people that lived in the area because, you know, you're going to be right on the right of way. Some people that live next to the tracks wanted to see how things were going to look like. So we did a lot of that work. This is like the sexy work that I didn't get to be involved with. I was involved with it. Soil. <laughs> this one part. Um, I gotta slow down when I speak, right? Because otherwise I'm gonna be done in like 20 minutes. <laughs> um, by the way, everybody is understanding my accent and stuff. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is now the meat and potatoes here. The um, this is how the uh, existing commuter rail. Uh, the plan was let's recycle or let's reuse as much as we have right now from the existing tracks that go from um, North Station all the way, I think it's the lower line. Um, so this is how it looks like, right? You have, the right of way is right here, and you have a sloped slide like this, and you have the tracks in the middle. So the plan was to, you know, expand, cut it like that, put some retaining walls, stay as close as you can to the right of way, and, and then build new tracks and put them in the middle. So here is what the requirements were. This is what we want to do. However, we need to know how much soil we need to excavate. We need to know how contaminated it is. We need to actually know exactly where all the contaminated soil is within like a two feet interval from like the surface down. Uh, we need to be able to track it back. Like if they find it, once you dispose it in a facility, they want to know where, the, where did this come from. So we had to be able to 
kind of say this is contaminated and it's here, but also it's going to go there and then backwards if necessary. So uh, we also, you know, had a, a team of uh, environmental experts, soil people that know about pollutants and things like that, that are not necessarily GIS experts. So how are they going to be QAQCing all this data that we're going to have? Because we're going to have to sample for a lot of stuff. So building a tool for them that they can review all that information. And so that also that we can share it in a way that everybody can understand it. So that's kind of what was, Chris, how do we do this? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, you go home and you're like, mm. <laughs> And then you have to talk to other people and do this brainstorming session because you, you just have to come up with a way of tracking it. So I don't know if this is the right way, but this is the, right, the way we developed and we designed as a way of tracking things. Uh, by the way, some considerations on the design are the following. The design is not done. It might change over time. So right now we might say the walls are right here, but then, you know, Two months from now, they might move the wall, and then all your calculations are wrong. Um, we're not done sampling soil, and we will not probably be done because we keep sampling as the project on, goes on. So that's another moving target. And the other moving target is that the regulations that tell you how to classify soil depending on the contaminants might change as well. So you have nothing to hold on to like this, which tells me I have to build a solution that I can redo fairly easily. That sounds like I need to come up with a program, right? I need to code it so that we can redo it over and over as things change. So um, this is a picture of, of the drilling right there. So the plan was this. I said, well, how much detail do you need horizontally? And they said, well, I just need to know if it's on the left side of the track or on the right side of the track or on the center of the track. And then um, I don't remember exactly what the requirements were for like this, but they were stations. So we decided to build these rectangles on each side of the tracks. And then, you know, we overlaid the, 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 the right of way too. But we called each one of these was going to be a soil management unit as in horizontal, right? So this was Medford, um, this was the Medford branch, so Medford branch. So the key things, data management is identifiers, unique identifiers, so things that get like psh, psh, uh, lost in translation. So every single uh, area was identified as I'm in this line, this is my station, 349. This, well, in this case, 251, in the left side of the track. This is the group it belongs to, and this is the zone, I, the ID of that soil management unit. We just call them soil management units, okay? So this is on horizontal, but now you have to imagine this thing is have to be characterized vertically down every two feet to, 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 to know what's going on. So, I mean, again, if at the end of the day what they want is a hole this big, and they were going to build walls like that. We're going to excavate this much. We need to calculate all these volumes. We need to know in which zones they are. So we had this, the left, the right, and the center. And then um, we had to calculate volumes on each um, area like this. And then, you know, they go out, they take borings, they look at the different levels of contaminant, they want to know down to feed, you know, what's going on. So this was the type of, uh, and now this was like, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to calculate it like this. Um, so this just, I'm going to explain this process in detail now. That's what this presentation is about. But this was like, okay, now I have this kind of cake, right? So I'm transforming reality into this model that looks like a rectangle with like a bunch of different um, layers under. And then in this case, very lightly color-coded by contaminated, impacted, or clean. Um, and we had to calculate all these volumes individually to know exactly what's going on. We call it the makeup of the, of the SMU or the soil management unit. 
Now, the thing is that you think, like, I'm going to do this. You cannot just do it on a desktop because we have a team of people. Data is everywhere. Um, so you need, we were leveraging the tools that we had. And one of the tools that we have is an enterprise GIS system, which allows you to share GIS information across your team. And we had databases in different places. So for example, here we, were, we will build a database that would just you know, grab all the information about the alignments and the right of way and where the walls are going to be and surface information. And that's the, that's the data set that we would use to calculate volumes. Um, and then we had other databases that had to do with all the soil management part and you know, what's going on what type of soil, what type of the borings and all that. And then you, you bring those two together to create that project um, layer that we're going to be using that we're also going to be sharing. But that's the other part is like you, if you're on your own working with you and two more folks, you can just stay here. But if, if you need to publish the data online so that people can grab it and look at it on your phone and, and be in the field and be like, I'm here in this station. And, I'm bored, and this is the boring. I want to know last time they drilled around here what the results were. So we had to have this type of tool. So that for to do that, you have to have a publication database where it allows you to publish those results. And we had that. Um, so when we started working this, let's say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna um, look at um, first the total volume and see how that works, and the input data that we had was LiDAR information for like the surface. We had CAD data for the alignments, where the walls were going to be and the tracks were going to be. No, the CAD, the CAD was for the track alignments. And the, and the Civil 3D, OK, I'm going to put this symbol here. The Civil 3D <laughs> was really tough. That's, that's like a smart way of building. Have you ever worked with the Civil 3D, any of you guys here? No? So you might, it's like telling a computer, like, I want a wall that in profile looks like this and, and just do the whole thing. So it's kind of a parametric way of designing something, right? So you, it was really hard to convert um, data from Civil 3D and bring it into GIS. And then the last part um, also, so this is like, this is easy. LiDAR goes in GIS just fine. CAD just fine as long as people, you know, put their projections and that type of stuff. Um, Civil 3D, uh, yeah, yeah, that took a while. <laughs> and then, you know, Bentley inroads for getting it. That was like really tough, um, but we managed to bring it in. And we used some models to do that as well. But at the end of the day, we had the data that we needed to start with the calculations. And what we did is we started doing a pilot, right? When you don't know what is the best methodology to do something and you can think of three or four, why not test them all out and see which one works best? And then you can see what hurdles you might encounter. So um, anybody here does, has done any GIS before? Yeah? So if I talk, I've been talking about GIS and geographic information systems without really introducing what it was. <laughs> so I'm sorry. But it's, uh, they are like databases which you know, allows you to do a spatial analysis. Um, and you can see things visually. And also, you know, you, they have all this attribute data uh, associated with that. Imagine database that knows where things are. Um, so you have different data formats. And one of the data formats, uh, it's, called, it's called a TIN. And I'm sure you guys have seen um, TINs without knowing it's a TIN. But when you see a surface and it's represented in a way, like in movies, you see them like all these triangles going like that, right? That's a TIN, right? It's a triangulated network. So your, your vertexes represent the elevations, and you just add a line to connect them all, and that's how you have a surface. Um, so we, were, we could, you know, now we have LiDAR information, which are just points with elevation associated to them. We can transform all these points into a TIN, or we can make them as vectors with this feature that was uh, a new data type of uh, format called multi-patch features, or we could use rasters. And I I'm going to talk about the rasters later. But we, we use you know, a TIN with this tool called extrude between. So we're, pretty much what I'm trying to say is like we use three method, four methodologies to calculate the volumes and, and see which one works best. So rasters, which are the ones, um, we have two types of raster here. 
Um, rasters um, require a resolution that you're going to use. Rasters are pretty much, imagine pixels, right, squares. And, and you can say, okay, I'm, I'm in this, I'm at this elevation and the entire three feet around me, right, or, you know, I'm at three, three by three, three feet square, I'm represented this elevation. So the, the, the thinner or the smaller the elevation, the better results you're going to come up with. So um, with one foot, one foot resolution of raster, uh, the teen uh, math or um, GS uh, or the CAT analysis using also triangulated networks, we came up with very similar results. Three, foot, uh, three feet with raster, not so good. So what happened is that you know, we found that some methodologies were really uh, time consuming to prepare the data, to clean, to process the information. So after trying these methods, we decided, okay, the one that runs the best is the raster. But we needed to use it with like a one, one foot resolution to create like good results. But the raster simplified a lot of the problems of, you know, surfaces that came up like weird when you started subtracting one surface from the next. So raster was a winner. Um, so we have that kind of like, okay, this is how we're going to do for the volume. So now what are we going to do for classifying all the soil? So the classification of the soil um, consisted on three steps. The first step is go and sample, take your samples, bring them to the lab, right? And determine how dirty or clean is each boring that you're taking. So now you're just classifying your sample. And now, the next step is to be like, okay, if I have so many samples in this one SMU, remember the rectangle, how does my rectangle look like vertically, right? So you are now kind of interpolating a little bit vertically to be like, okay, that was really polluted up here, not so much, so how we're going to create that makeup of how which zone is going to look like. And then you don't, we didn't have borings through the entire corridor, so we had to now assign, you know, making those assumptions of like, okay, what's going to happen if this one is polluted and this one is polluted, maybe the one in the middle is polluted too. So, you know, this type of interpolation going on. So three major blocks to take care of. This is the only environmental actual slide that I have. This is everything that we had to sample for. And I think I might have forgotten some. So, um, a ton of metals. VOCs, this is VOCs, all this, you know, S VOCs, PCVs, TPH. So now think about this. Every, you have five miles, you might have 100, 200 borings. Each one has all this data with their corresponding detection limits and la, 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 la. So this is a monster type of data. We have to handle a lot of information. Um, for each one of these soil samples. So to do this, we use this uh, product called Equis. Has anybody heard of Equis before? No? All right, well, Equis, it's, um, it's, a, it's a service uh, that you can subscribe to my company. Um, we do a lot of environmental projects for many different things. And it's really user-friendly because it's a database that sits somewhere in our servers. Sometimes it's uh, in their Equis servers. So we can, there is different types of configurations. In this case, we had it. Uh, I'm actually not sure if it was in our servers, but what you can do is you can tap into it and request the data securely, right? And then, so they manage all this data for you, which is great. Pretty much, you go to the field, you sample, you send the samples to the lab, you tell the lab people we're working with Equis, the data goes into Equis, and then you can pull it and make reports and look at it from many different places. And one of the cool places you can look at your data from is GIS. So it, you can just connect to that database from GIS and see everything in there. So this was very convenient for us. So we use this Equis. Um, now, once you pull the data from the Equis, though, you need to look at your regulations. And you need to be like, OK, what's the detection limit, or what's the minimum amount or maximum amount of 
arsenic allowed, so 20, so who has more than 20 milligrams per kilo or whatever, and go through all that stuff and decide if my sample, these are the classifications, A, clean, B1, eh, not so clean, right? B2, worse, B3, here are the DOCs, C, so from A to C3 being C3 the worst. Um, that had like all that stuff in it. And this unfortunately was a manual process. Like we had to have a team of environmental experts looking at the soils and classifying them and, and, and deciding each sample what it is. So now, this is, this is my layer. We took two, this is one soil management unit. We took two, two borings. We had data coming back. Somebody already decided this is C1 contaminated, B1 so-so, and A clean. Now we have to do this, right? And calculate then all the volumes. So we use an access database for that. Because that was several years ago and I didn't know any Python <laughs> or R. Now there is people that can do all these things with uh, better tools. But we use an access database to do that. And then from that, we put it in, in RGIS. Um, here I have a lot of animation. I don't remember why I have all this animation. All I'm trying to say is that we had areas that had borings. Now this is, again, this is looking at the corridor from, from the top, right? These are all the cells in the middle, so the, the, the tracks run through here. Here is the, the end of the right away, right? And here are places with borings, color-coded by probably what um, level of contaminant they had on the surface. So what we did is we had to come up with another, is this working? Another way of say, okay, um, until you find something better, you're gonna assign the same makeup to all of this. And we try to be conservative, so assuming like the worst things that can happen. Um, so that's how we went about this. How are we doing on time? Okay. Um, all right. So next step was to calculate the cake. The, the cake, we call it, uh, uh, yes, I call it the cake because it looks like a cake. Like we know what's going on, calculate all these volumes. Um, so this is a little bit of about rasters, okay? So rasters, um, that's the, the type of file that we decided to use to represent a surface. And they represent the surface as if they were like pixels, right? Imagine, or, or like little areas. And this would be a one, one foot interval. So as you can see, if this is your real slope and you're using a raster, you're gonna have some errors because it's not perfect, right? So we needed to, to calculate that like this. Um, so we have two types of errors associated with that. Um, in this case, imagine here, this would be like the three feet so you have horizontal because your raster doesn't really make it all the way to the right away. Um, and then the vertical one, if you use three feet, you're even incurring more error than if you have one foot resolution. But, you know, there is always that sweet spot. It's like, okay, uh, three feet, we had like 2.5 million data points uh, per surface. So that took like five minutes to do the raster calculations. If you use one foot, it, took, it takes 30 minutes. So can you live with 30 minutes? Yes, we can totally live with 30 minutes. That's your coffee break. You go, let it run, and then, you know, we come back and hope it didn't crash. <laughs> and, and that's what we decided to, to do. Sometimes, you know, this is, this, is type of, this is what we have to do, right? You have to make a decision on, on you know, depending on with a, what approach you're gonna use, you know, the computational requirements they play a, a role. Um, so, after we had done this, we actually, again, this, is, this was like presentation oriented towards uh, GIS uh, people, but we had the raster to calculate all these volumes, but then we also had to, to carry on um, the characterization of, of how, polluting, how pollut polluted it was. So, for that reason, we ended up having to convert all these data point, um, raster mass to, to points, and clean it up so that we could um, query the data easily later. So this is um, 
a screenshot of one of the three models that we built to do that. Um, this is called Model Builder. It's a tool instead of GIS that allows you to program fairly easily. So it, it looks, I thought it would look cool, uh, but um, really we're not gonna go into the details of how everything worked inside. But um, easy programming in GIS through Model Builder, yes. Oh, the, the surface goes that you were mapping it as not existing layers because you had to go down the edge. Yes, because we have the surface like this and you're just, yeah. you're just, um, I'm not cutting it horizontally. Okay. We were just, you were just going two feet down. So, so what we, happens is like it starts. I totally get it. So when they excavate, they just, they, that's why they cut down all these trees, clearly. Yeah. No, they are doing it the regular way. They're going just across. Yeah. And so somehow we have to get from your model that show this to yeah. an excavation. Okay. That's true. Um, we never got to that. <laughs> this is like a, oops, let me go back. Can I play this? This was just like you can also um, animate the stuff. Um, in here, so that would show you like the volumes, a little animation of the volumes. Um, and here is like at the end, the, the, this is like what, you know, the joint venture folks wanted to know. It's like, okay, so how does this look like, how many? So it, it turned to be about 700,000 tons of soil. Um, so not quite a million, but you know, a lot of soil. Um, this is by depth, so and this is the contaminants that we had. So um, obviously the, the worst is always on the very surface and then it went down, um, it goes down this way. So after 12 feet down, things look pretty clear. This was like all the, um, you know, categorization of the total amount of soil uh, by the type of contaminant. And so we had like, you know, pretty much a quarter of it had some sort of contaminant level. Um, we were able to obviously display all this information in GIS so that people could see it at different depths. Uh, these are just another type of visuals that we created at the time. Um, we had a tool in ArcGIS, so this is ArcGIS Online, uh, where you could publish your information and then, you know, folks could come in and click on the borings and they can see what the class is from 0 to 2, from 2 to 4, like in depth going down, um, the zone ID and the boring, and you know, that's just like a user-friendly way for them to be able to mark things up or require some changes in the data. And that was where we got to. And then we were talking about what are we gonna be doing next. And we we're talking, it was very exciting because we had to deal with things like that. We had to deal with the stockpile management uh, of like, okay, we're gonna send this soil from here to a stockpile and then from there. So we were like, wow, all these other tools we need to build. But the project stopped. They were like, we're out of money. Stop doing anything, stop charging. <laughs> so that was, that was it. That was what we got to do. Sorry for the pua, pua, pua moment. <laughs> Do you guys have questions? Lillian? My thought is industrial archaeology. My immediate thought is, gosh, I know from digging as archaeologist in, in prehistory and in these historical times that, oh, it's confusing. Sorry, Ninian Stein, uh, Environmental Studies. Um, here at Tufts, um, as in, putting on my hat as an industrial archaeologist, I know from digging at prehistoric as well as historic sites that things don't, it, the, the concept of, of things being laid down in linear layer is true, but also you've got a lot of per perturbation in humans coming along and digging things up. Mm. And as soon as I saw your sort of assumption of layers of things sort of moving through the soil in critical fashions, I was like, gosh, that's a lot of land mass to assume that things are not going to have been turned over, for example, that you might have clean surface. Yeah. And, and I was kind of going, gosh, what are the model assumptions here that supported sort of how the sort of histories of the soils and the sort of movement and per perturbation and sort of how did you take into account local excavations? Why is soil, you know, is this all the original soil in situ? Is there movement of, 
I also find myself thinking about inflow of hazardous chemicals from other sites. That's where right. These coming from. Yeah. What's the history of de deposition? And how did you take some of those sorts of factors into account? And I also want to ask a big step back for my students who may not be familiar with the slide where you showed all of the different hazards. If you could just go back and explain a oh, little sure. bit about this to the students, why the people might be concerned about those. So big, big picture question, and also just sort of a back background question. So. Um, the one with the black background, right? Yeah. You want me to talk about it? <laughs> Why don't you talk about it? Because I, I mean, I know these guys are bad guys. I just don't know why. <laughs> and I don't know, I know what VOCs are in general, but I don't know where they come from. Sure, yeah. talk a little bit about it. I can't Thanks. say as much as a chemist would, <laughs> but I can tell you some of the sort of general concerns. If we're talking about um, heavy metals, we may be talking about atmospheric deposition, we may be talking about industrial processes that led to the metals getting into soil, so um, a lot of these are highly cadmium, chromium, nickel, lead, mercury, uh, highly toxic, they can have both carcinogenic outcomes, they can also have outcomes in other paradigms like developmental delays for children, um, lead in particular they could have, um, but other, other sorts of effects on your system, arsenic obviously famous for being a poisoning agent, High, at high levels in human systems. VOC stands for volatile organic compounds, volatile organic chemicals. Um, there's even another word that C is sometimes, volatile organic carbons, I believe. No, compounds. Um, there's even another C there that I'm missing. And a lot of these are used in different industrial processes. Some of them are byproducts of industrial processes, things we don't intend to produce. Um, benzene, for example, is a byproduct of a lot of fossil fuel production and the use of fossil fuels. Um, but some of these others are cleaners, industrial solvents, things you might see if you had a leak at a dry cleaner in a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about how some of these got here, if we're thinking about the who settled along rail lines aside from uh, houses, we might expect to see dry cleaners. We might expect corner at Medford. If you think about it, there's the dry cleaner. Let's hope they don't have any spills. Um, there's some restaurants. Historically, there may have been some factories building some stuff, making some stuff, and that there, some of these chemicals are coming from that. Some of it's coming from flow in the water. This is a heavy, heavily industrialized rail corridor. Some of this is probably coming from um, discharges to air. Uh, PCBs, um, also a carcinogen. I'm going to, Carl, do you want to say anything about what PCB stands for? <laughs> Polycarbonated biphenyl. Yeah. Like that. Polycarbonated biphenyl. <laughs> I think I read that just also, <laughs> also a carcinogen, so of a concern for, for all of those reasons. Yeah. So so yeah, so one of the one of the why they wanted to know exactly all these volumes and the classification is because when you need to dispose dispose the soil, um, you only can you cannot just make it go away. Right? So, and if you have it and it's clean soil, number one, their regulatory agencies are going to require you to demonstrate that it's clean. So you have to come back and show them all your sampling protocols and all that. And then you might say, okay, it's clean. So this is, this is like one part of the project. This soil may be clean. Now, is it adequate to reuse for, for building this project and doing it at backfill? We don't know because that, they need to be characterized on their only, you know, is it the good type of soil? Maybe it's not. Maybe, maybe it's clean, but it's too clayish or too sandy, and it doesn't have the, the characteristics that you need uh, from a, you know, I guess engineering, civil engineering, not so much environmental standpoint. Um, but, so that will be like the things that come along with clean soil for reuse. If it's dirty, and if it's dirty, a different as we said, different types of uh, degrees. Now you're going to send it to a facility. And that facility is going to charge you. And they're going to charge you more money if it's more contaminated. So, and those rates are not like, you know, they are like Amazon. You say one day and the next day is $2 less. <laughs> they're all negotiable, right? So if so this was like all this game of like, we need to know how much before they find out how much, because if they know um, or they assume that we're going to need to dispose of so many tons of soil, they're going to jack up the prices. Imagine you're the only facility that accepts like C3 soil. You'll be like, I'm rich, right? <laughs> so these guys wanted to lock those prices earlier on the project, you know, before, you know, before they started having to send 
things out. And that's something I've been, I had to work um, in another project where it was pretty interesting from a, also like a data management programming and, and point where um, that was for an ExxonMobil client. And they had like so many facilities that they could bring soil, but you had to pay the guys by the truck. And then it's like, okay, this one is cheaper than that one, but which one is closer to my location? So building this type of tools for like optimizing your disposal costs, um, that's um, another application, I guess, of GIS for soil management. <laughs> yes. So I, I just the, um, the way you ended there, which is the project stopped, Kleinfelder was no longer involved. Nobody was involved. Yeah, they, so, yeah. but now they're back at it. They're back at so it. So is the data that you collected during your time, does that get passed on to whoever is doing the next stage, or is that proprietary to Kleinfelder? So I'm kind of curious as to whether or not we ended up spending millions and millions more dollars to have the stop and then the start again, or whether the, the work you did was able to be transferred and the, and the protocols, the data, the way you organized the data was clear enough that the next company, they must have hired somebody else, mm -hmm. was able to use your data. Do you have any sense of that? Well, I actually was asked for some of the information. So uh, also, so this is one of the things we did in GIS. The other thing we did was, um, it's called Geodocs, which is any document that had anything to do with that area for utilities, <laughs> electric utilities, sewer, water, you know, gas, anything you want. Any, like these is thousands of documents were scanned, we, and we geocoded them so people can go on a map and click on the map and then brrr, all these documents you can pick through uh, what's in there. So they were like, where is all that stuff? <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's gonna take two days to upload this to the, an FTP site. But yes, it's the data, it's science data. So we, here you go. You know, and you know, one of the things is like if you have your databases are pretty well organized and you know, documentation supporting how we went about it, I would think they'll be able to pick it up from there. Yeah. For the um where you're interpolating between two boards. Yeah. Yeah, so for for places that you didn't actually have board data, do you think is and I know you're not really involved anymore, but but it seems like it's possible that there could have you could have missed contamination. Um, like if both places on either side were clean, but there happened to be a spill in the middle that you missed. Yeah. What do you know if if there's um, is there a requirement to go back and verify after the fact, or is it possible that you could miss, you could miss big sections? Well, we definitely miss stuff because this was like the first round and uh -huh. we didn't cover the entire area. And the idea when we designed this process is like, we're gonna keep getting more and more borings as the project continues. So we will, we will um, <laughs> fill in all these data gaps with real data. Okay. Uh, we try to be conservative in the sense that everything is gonna be dirty unless you find something clean. So it wasn't a linear or an it's or, or like it wasn't interpolated really. It was just filling in the gaps with the worst data that you had until you find better data. Uh, but you're right. Like if it was clean and clean in between, our assumption is clean because there is nothing else. So you could have missed the spots. Yeah. And yes, and we didn't do any of that um, transport contamination simulations, no. <laughs> that, was, that was my question. Was there any sort of an effort to take in the, into account historic maps of what industries were located by the side of the track yeah, historically? Yeah, I don't recall or, doing that. Or no. any sort of fluid dynamics that might be bringing... That would have been awesome, yes. Because that's definitely doable. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, let's think... Oh, One more? question? What exactly constitutes a clean soil? Uh, what, do you need to meet some type of threshold? Or? Yeah, so you have, um, 
So I, I didn't do that part, but my understanding is that EPA and maybe some other agency um, would be, okay, if you have, if you exceed this limit from this contaminant, right, um, so they give you the rules. Like this is everything you need to sample for and then the if this and this and that type of thing. So you could only hit, I guess if you never, you have to be always under the, the maximum allocated amount uh, for that contaminant in order to be clean. If anything starts exceeding that amount, then you start following into the other buckets of categories. And I, I'm, it might be that some pollutants are worse than others too. So it had to do with the amount and the concentrations. Well, I think one thing that's clear here is that no two projects are ever going to be the same, and then you're going to have to build completely different ways of attacking it. So yeah. thank you for sharing your story on this one. And uh, now I know, I, had, I hadn't realized how that cut was going to be and why they took all those trees down, which was such a nice story. <laughs> At the beginning of the semester, we were saying, why? Now we know why, and hopefully they'll put some trees back up. But let's thank Chris one more time. Thank you. And just a reminder, if you wouldn't mind taking a chair to the back, that would be super helpful.